On the track is a web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. Okay, action! So, Rosita, how's it going down in Brixton and at the, the old uh, youth outreach project? Okay, we are spearheading a new diversity and inclusivity uh, project. Oh, what's that involved then? Oh, we get all kinds of uh, kids and youths from all kinds of ethnic backgrounds and diversities and where we we tell them to run with scissors <laughs> once again i think that this is an admirable use of local government resources well done to everyone <laughs> I really like the old credits. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, once again. It's Saturday afternoon, and Saturday afternoon is synonymous in all our hearts and minds with another episode of On the Track. My name's John Downs, I'm the director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, and this week I am very, very pleased to have with me the, probably my oldest friend. I think he is the person I have known longer than anybody in the world except for my brother and my cousin Penny. Let me introduce you to Richard Muirhead. Well, Richard, say hello to the boys and girls, Richard. Hello. Hi, people. Hi. Uh, Richard, who has now been adopted by Archie as his new favourite uncle, and he, Archie's spending his whole time sitting by Richard on the sofa, being very, very lapdoggy. Richard is an expert in all sorts of cryptozoological matters, but one of the ones I think I'm, the thing I think I want to talk to him today about is one of the things he's most well known for, his research into the flying snake of Namibia. Stop! 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 I know that there are a lot of you out there who, like Louis, are victims of the current education system. So I think I should probably tell you where Namibia is. Oh, OK. Jonathan, young people don't need to know about the geography of Southwest Africa. The only thing we need to know about from geography is where the good coffee comes from and what Coca-Cola taught us, that penguins and polar bears hold hands and dance around in circles around the North Pole. It's here in Southwest Africa and it was first colonised in the 19th century by Germans and Dutch and it was part of the German Empire up until we gave the Bosch a taste of good old British spunk at the end of the First World War. Ha ha! That showed them! Now, Richard, tell me, well, what is a flying snake? What's it doing in Namibia? And well, there are reports all over the world of flying snakes. Uh, reports from North America. Uh, there's a case in Bulgaria. There are cases in various parts of the world. There's even one in Pentlin Castle in South Wales, isn't there? Yes, there are reports of flying snakes in South Wales with wings like jewels, multicoloured jewels, which I think actually are feral peacocks, because uh, peacocks have, as we all know, brightly coloured feathers. Um, in South East Asia, there are snakes that glide from treetops. 
but the flying snake of Namibia does not fall into any of those categories. The flying snake of Namibia, which was reported in 1942, is a cryptid that that genuinely does seem to be able to fly or glide. It carries a light on its head. If it's a light behaving strangely in the West, we can call it a UFO. In Namibia, when this light is seen at night time, bobbing along above the horizon, the local Nama tribe say, oh, it's a flying snake. In the 1942 case, a shepherd boy was looking after his father's flocks at the bottom of a overhanging rock with a cave in it and something like the flying snake glided down and hit the ground leaving a mark on the sandy soil and a smell like tar so when I did my research into it in the mid 1990s I drew parallels with the medieval dragon dragon lives in a cave leaves a kind of tarry smell um, and there are various other parallels with the night flying snake in Namibia and the famous uh, lady Courtney Latimer stop 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 I feel that I should interject here for people like Louis that despite the fact that you really should know who Marjorie Courtney Latimer was and shame on you if you don't but she was the person who whilst working at the museum in East London in South Africa discovered the first modern coelacanth and if you don't know what a coelacanth is God only knows what you're doing watching this show end of my interjection bing bong and the famous uh, lady Courtney Latimer who invested the coelacanth in the mid 30s also investigated this 1942 case and apparently took photographs of the tracks on the ground but by the time I tried to contact her she was very elderly or, or had passed away the flying snake of Namibia or other mystery snakes are also associated with underwater lairs where they lure people to their death it apparently had little horns on its head bat like wings near its near its head um, there is a whole folklore associated with flying snakes in Namibia which a lady called Sigrid she met a German lady folklore expert I contacted she was familiar with the flying snake of Namibia it's it's a kind of uh, is it a flesh and blood animal or is it a zoo form phenomena it seems to overlap between being a flesh and blood cryptid and a folklore entity uh, and if you purchase the 1996 CFZ yearbook, you can read my analysis into it. I just want to add a little 14 element, more of a 14 element. This whole personal research into the flying snake of Namibia began when I went into the basement of a bookshop in Charing Cross Road, was scanning the shelves found a book called These Wonders to Behold I forget the author's name and just was flicking through it in the bookshop and I came across the story so I wasn't intending to find a story on I didn't even know there was such a thing as a flying snake in Namibia until I browsing in this bookshop so that's serendipity for you serendipity rather something's always in interested me about this is that Namibia as you know and I know was part of the German Empire and it was colonized by Germans and to a lesser extent 
Dutch in the 19th century. And I found it very interesting that there are stories of flying dragons with lights on their heads in German folklore and now something almost identical in Namibian folklore. Well, that's correct. There's a whole interchange between Germany and Namibia back to the 20th, 19th centuries. There were missionaries, uh, I think Lutheran missionaries from Germany in Namibia or Southwest Africa. And so the story, the question is, did the story migrate from Namibia to Germany or vice versa? Or was it a two way, two way interaction? My bet would be that because the dragon legends in Germany go back an awful long way and we know that, I'm wondering if somehow, um, I don't mean to be too simplistic, but maybe some German missionaries running a mission school were telling stories that they knew from their childhood to Namibian children and the whole thing. Maybe there was already a real animal there, but then some of the other attributes which had been sort of pinned on it by um, Namibian children who'd been told all these German dragon stories by people at the missions, by missionaries at the mission schools, for example. I wonder if this is a mechanism by which um, a very real animal can become a monster. Definitely, it's definitely possible. Um... Certainly somebody viewing this video could look into that because this is an area I didn't really look into when I was uh, writing about this in the mid 90s. Um, there's another thing that should be pointed out. There are reports from Papua New Guinea of an animal called the Ropen. I'm not going to get into the whole creationist evolution debate about it, but it, it also is reported to have a light on its head. Uh, and a team, a Swedish team, in I think 1975, reported a sighting of a pterosaur or pterodactyl-like animal in Namibia. But I, I think the Namibian flying snake is a separate entity altogether. I think, I think the flying snake and the pterosaur or whatever are two different stories. It's worthy of further investigation though. I remember back when you were first studying the flying snake and I was much younger and more naive there and I liked to think that you could categorise things into real life cryptids or zoo form phenomena. I think nowadays things are much more complicated than that and so there could well be and from the research you've come up with, I think there probably is a large flying or gliding reptile in Namibia that's unknown to science. But because of the sort of social transition between Germany and what was then German South uh, East Southwest Africa, and is now in Namibia, the, some of the supernormal characteristics have been added on to what is actually a very ordinary creature, it's just unknown to science. So I think there is certainly a heck of a lot more, more research that needs to be done there. And I think you, Richard, my dear boy, need to be congratulated for having got the ball rolling in the first place. Well done, mate. Thanks, John. And now we go back to Cheshire and Weird Weekend North, where Richard and Jackie are doing a sterling job covering it for CFZ TV. But Richard was also doing his 
traditional Weird Weekend thing of in the guise of Barry Tadcaster and together with various glove puppets he was introducing the speakers. Here he introduces Alan Murdy. Alan Murdy is a 14 greengrocer. He is here today to explain why pears are the most 14 of all fruit. Sometimes we smell pears where there are no pears. There are theories that gigantic prehistoric pears thought long extinct may still linger in remote parts of the world, occasionally glimpsed by bold explorers. And when you see pears in a greengrocer, how do you know that they are, they are mortal pears and not the ghosts of pears just sitting there in the box with the mortal pears? You don't. Alan Murray is going to explain all about the strangeness of pears. Luckily for us, Richard and Jackie caught up with him after his talk for a brief chat. Whichever you'd prefer. That's uh, so, uh, all right. Probably looks like the more <laughs> distinguished. Of yeah. Here we have the ever fascinating uh, Alan Murdy, who did a wonderful talk on um, Bawley Rectory. Now, something I did not know and I'd never heard of before was this whole. Uh, Catacomb, if you will, underneath it, full of bones. It's the first I'd ever heard of it. And you'd like me to elaborate on it? Yes, please. Well, of course. Well, this is actually goes to prove that ghost hunters do actually occasionally do something useful, even if they're not performing uh, at, at their best. It, the discovery, or rather rediscovery of it, goes back to 1988 when a group of Essex ghost hunters were in the churchyard of Borney, um, hoping for some kind of manifestation, which is a bit of an optimistic hope, because, to be honest with you, not really very much has happened at Borley since about 1960. A great deal of the number of the stories you hear are probably down to wishful thinking, or probably have normal explanations. But they were in the churchyard not actually finding any manifestations when one of them leant rather heavily against a cross uh, of a grave which had the unfortunate effect of upending a cross and remote uh, exposing stonework beneath it and uh, luckily they weren't pursued for any offence under the, uh, the Burials Act 1860 in relation to, to misbehaviour in the churchyard, but it turned out what they had discovered beneath this grave was a set of steps. A set of steps that leapt down to the side of the church where there was a door. And the door had last been opened in 1920 because there was a stone that had been marked 1920. They had rediscovered the crypt, which runs almost the entire length of Borley Church, by their inadvertent negligence. And it was then obviously looked into and investigated. It had been the crypt originally had been rediscovered uh, in about 1920 by the Reverend Harry Bull, who was the son of the builder of Borley Rectory. Um, he, it, Reverend Henry Bill built it, uh, Bull built it in 1862. He passed on the living of the parish to his son, who rediscovered this crypt. And effectively, he'd gone into the crypt to see what was happening and came out um, rather quickly, one suspects at first instance. He found underneath Borley Church, uh, it appear to have been used for secret Roman Catholic worship during the worst Tudor repression of uh, the uh, Catholics, probably the uh, 1580s onwards. And there was a dressed altar with a cross at one end, and around it was a rather ghoulish scene, a collection of skeletons. Because the crypt had been used for burials, it may have been used again in the 19th century, no one's completely sure. But the, uh, the effect, what had happened in this crypt, was that water had flooded into it 
over the years, and the coffins in which these skeletons had been, uh, been contained had rotted away. So you were left with really quite a, quite a horrific scene of a lot of skeletons standing around an altar, almost as though they were in positions of worship. It sounds like a, an M.R. James story, it, it really doesn't it? It, 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 it reminds me of a, a late 1970s horror novel set in, in the United States called Golgotha Falls, which involved a church with a, a congregation of skeletons set up. It was, it was all, quite, all quite grim and ghoulish stuff. Well, that's what they were discovered in 1988. It turns out Harry Price had heard rumours of the crypt in uh, the 1940s from the Reverend Alfred Henning, who had, who was effectively, although he did not really live in the building, the last rector of Borley Rectory. Um, he didn't really live in the place, and the church sold it uh, in 1938, and it burned down the following, following year. But the Reverend Henning had heard rumours of this crypt, and in August 1943 they attempted to find it, except they went in the wrong direction. They started looking for the crypt uh, in the church itself, in the chancel, and lifted what appeared to be a promising capstone above it, but in fact they couldn't find a way in. And maybe if they surveyed the place a bit more, they might have made the same discovery as the Essex Ghost Hunters did um, over 40 years later. What they then did was go over to the rectory and start digging up the rectory uh, floor in the cellar and on the 17th of August 1943 they discovered some bones, um, a part of the skull and a jawbone which were identified with the uh, possibly the ghostly nun who had been haunting uh, Borley, the Borley Rectory area since the 1860s at least, according to many sightings and according to the stories. So that's the background to the crypt. There was also a story um, going round that the, 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 the coffins had been moved in a crypt at Borley by some preternatural means. Ah, like the uh, the Chase Tomb. Like the Chase Tomb in Barbados. Yes. Surprisingly small, small. I've been there. It's tiny. Mm, yes. It's, um, yeah, and that, that, of course, is the iconic moving mm. coffins story. Uh, there was a similar story told about Borley, at least as rumours, but it never got any further because they didn't find the story, didn't find anything from the story yeah. in 1943. In 1948... Uh, James Turner, who uh, was by that stage living on the site of the Borley, Re of Borley Rectory, which had burnt down mm. um, nine years before, and the East Anglian writer Ronald Blythe uh, were doing some renovation work in Borley Church, and they discovered what may well be the remains of an ossuary. They found a great many bones in doing um, renovation work around the altar in Borley Church. So the whole place seems to have um, had not only a crypt, but a great many burials also around the, the altar area. Um, and this is interesting, we can say no, no more than this, is that many of the seance communications involving Borley had mentioned at some stage done in the, the late 1930s, had mentioned the presence of bones. Now maybe it's a good guess that you'd expect bones and uh, if you dig deep enough, you will find bones in most places. Fascinating. Well, I've, I've got to make a move because I'm, I'm being expected to, to introduce the next speaker. But uh, thanks a lot, Alan. That was absolutely brilliant. My pleasure. Cheers. Thank you. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And there's the ghost of Joe Strummer who is an ever more regular visitor to my little studio wants me to remind you always press the notification bell otherwise you won't be told when there's a new show to watch. And that would be an awful pity wouldn't it? 
And so, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of another show. Thank you very much for watching. I'd like to say a big, big, big thank you to everybody involved, which starts off, as always, with Louis, who does all sorts of things behind the scenes. But our special guests this week and the big contributors were Richard Muirhead and Richard Freeman and Jackie Tonks and Alan Murdy. Big, big thank you to all of you getting involved. A big thanks to Glenn Vaudry for allowing us to film at Weird Weekend North. And already I'm looking forward to what happens next year. Now, for a quick reminder, the CFZ Yearbook 2022-2023 stroke is now available. You can buy it at a reduced pre-order price at this address. And it's also in the blurb underneath. This offer will continue right up until Amazon get their fingers out and the book becomes available through the normal channels, like it will do sooner rather than later. However, 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 that's by the by. I have really enjoyed this show. It's always lovely to have Richard Muirhead on because he and I go back an awful long way. I can't remember if I said this earlier, but I've known Richard since he was four and I was 11. And that, as you can see by me, if not by Richard's particularly youthful visage, you can see <laughs> that I... It was quite a long time ago that I was 11. Let's just leave it at that. So, boys and girls, although this episode's over, I'll be back on Wednesday. What am I going to be talking about? I have no idea because I can't remember what I videoed. But we'll find out again very soon. So I'll be back on Wednesday and then I'll be back again next Saturday with another full-length episode of On The Track. So until then, for me, Richard Muirhead and the dog, who are, I think, the only people in the studio at the moment, be seeing you.